Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Coach Darcy Eichenberg, who is over in Florida. How are you doing, Darcy? I'm great. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing fantastic. And what we're going to talk about today is, is Darcy's new book uh, called Red Cape Rescue. And Darcy wrote this because as a coach and teacher, uh, you wanted or you watch too many talented professionals, just like you waste their time and energy feeling like they had no control over their lives at work. And most people uh, reach that situation uh, at some stage of their career where they just think, yeah, you know, everything is this, this job sucks, this place sucks, whatever. And, and what you're saying is, yeah, maybe it is a good time to leave. But maybe it's not. Maybe you can, you know, rescue your your career without leave, uh, leaving your job. And that's the name of the book is Red Cape Rescue. Save your career without leaving your job. So, Darcy, going back to the beginning here, um, what prompted you to write write this? Like, how many times did you come across or, or, or how often did you see people who were really struggling, who if they just changed some things could excel where they were as opposed to have to move on? Yeah, John, I've been noticing this for years, uh, that there would be super smart professionals, people who you and I just met them, we'd be like, wow, you know, they're good on paper, as they say, you know, great job, great company, great title, uh, maybe making great money in many people's eyes, or just have a, you know, a great life. And yet, they might be referred to me as a coach that, you know, a friend of theirs said, hey, go talk to Darcy you know, because you're, because you're clearly, there's something wrong. There's something that you're not happy or they just hit a natural speed bump. Company gets acquired, a leader leaves, uh, the, you know, where our, our workplaces are so organic in change happening all the time and different changes hit us in different ways. So whenever someone would hit some kind of speed bump could be a, as a speed bump that came internally, uh, hitting a birthday with a zero on the end or a friend or family member getting seriously ill. Those things all make us stop and say, wait a minute, is this what I want? And the truth is it happens in every single person's career and often more than once. And so what I found is that the conventional wisdom tells us when that happens, hey, you're not happy, go yeah. find another job. Like just, you, mm -hmm. know, uh, you know, get out of there, yeah. go find another job. But the truth is that when we really dig into it and tease it apart a little more, often there might be one or two core things that you have more control over than you ever realized. And so that's when I saw the pattern in these lessons and I started to put together the ideas in the book really around how you can take back control without having to change everything in your life. Yeah, and it's interesting that uh, what you just mentioned there is uh, that we often bring so many different things into our work life, uh, you know, influences, things that are happening outside, maybe triggers from the past, so many different things. And work sometimes can become a convenient scapegoat for all of those issues. Like it's all the fault of work instead of, as you say, is like looking at what are what maybe is really going on. That's a really insightful comment because I'm seeing that quite a bit right now where there's a lot of noise around the time we're taping this toward the end of 2021 of, of the noise of the great resignation, you know, the noise of, well, gee, everybody's doing it, everybody's quitting, so maybe I should too. And the truth is, though, I've seen people go through this pattern where they do go and find another job. Again, they're smart, they're valuable, they find something else. And six to nine months, the same kind of issues keep coming up. So wherever you go, there you are, I think was the Dr. Seuss line. Um, and so if there are things where you are not advocating for yourself in the right ways, you're not setting your boundaries in the right ways or the right ways for you, not necessarily right for someone else, but you know, getting clear on what's right for you. And um, a new job is not the solution to things that maybe aren't working for you on the inside. Yeah, and I think it is It is always an interesting point about, you know, wherever you go, there you are. Uh, the point is sometimes, 
you have to either look yourself or help somebody else look at that perhaps the common denom there is only one common denominator here for every situation <laughs> you find yourself in and unfortunately it's you or me as, as the case may be but i love this I, I love this and you know your part one of the book is all about resetting how you think and you talk about uh, conquer the battle of the brain i mean what, what do you mean by conquering the battle of the brain this is where it all starts, right? That we don't really believe we have control. We're waiting for the economy to change or our boss to change or our company to change. Uh, but in essence, we only control three things. We control what we think, what we say, and what we do. And that's it. And that's what the book's built on. Everything in the book is something you can do no matter what is happening in the world and starts with conquering the battle of the brain. You know, and this is just biology, right? We learned so much in the past several years from all the neuroscience research that's happening, but the biology of our brain is that there's a big part of it that just wants to keep us safe. It just wants to, um, you know, help us either you know, hide or, or fight, right? Fight or, fight or flight. And yet in our modern workplaces, those behaviors, there's so much nuance in between. And what I find often is that people don't recognize that they actually can take a beat and choose a thought as carefully as they might have chosen what clothes they're gonna wear that day. It's not easy by any means, but it is learnable and trainable and you can practice choosing the higher energy thought, the more positive thought than staying stuck in the thought that's pulling you back. Emotion puts us in motion. And so if we want to keep moving forward in our careers, positive emotions, energetic emotions are ones that will keep pulling us forward, even when times get tough. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. And it, and it is an interesting, it is interesting that how much control you have over how you show up, but how often people relinquish that control or or not even say relinquish or they ignore that they have that control and they just show up in any way, you know, that they're exactly in any way they're feeling that particular day based on who knows what. Right. Or, or we may just get caught up in kind of the wave of how people have vilified work in so many ways. We even have this in our language, right? We, oh, another day, another dollar, uh, you know, we go along to get along. It's not work or it's not personal. It's just work. I mean, we have these things in our language that we take for granted. But when you unpack them, you're like, wow. I would never talk about something I cared about with that kind of disdain and that kind of, uh, you know, insulting Eeyore voice. Uh, and, but we get caught up in that and we don't realize that by saying those things or believing those things, we actually pulls our energy down and makes us often feel uh, hopeless and gives us anxiety. There's a lot of things that we can take control over to have a better experience not only at work but in our lives yeah and, and one other interesting thing that you have in this in this uh, chapter on in this part of the book is unveiling your values and i think this is a i think this is really key because we hear an awful lot of talk nowadays about company values and core values and all of this and that people you know really want to know or want to work for companies that have this set of values or that set of values but I just took I was just thinking as you were talking there, it was it's like how many times do do people do we step back and say, Okay, before we deal with the company values, what are my values? What exactly are my values? And then I can figure out are they aligned to the company values rather than the other way around. And I don't think we spend enough time figuring out what our core values are. And when I have this conversation with clients, often people will assume they know their values. Oh, I'm very I'm clear, oh, you know, family, uh, health, but but then when they really dig into it, it's like, well, is that where I'm choosing to spend my time? Are those the things that I actually value? Are the things that, that you know, I am able to value, that I find valuable? It's kind of the, the breakdown of the word. And there are no good or bad values. But one of the things that I talk about in the book is, uh, to your point around assessing I mean, any kind of conflict with a company, with an organization, with another person, that when your values and somebody else's or an organization's are out of sync, it's not that one's good nor bad. It's just kind of like hitting two keys on a piano next to each other. It's not music. It's just noise. Uh, but independently, 
they're each just fine. So recognizing yours, and it's okay if your values are, I want wealth, I want power, I want, you know, those things are fine just to be clear about them. We don't all have to value motherhood and apple pie. Um, but I think too, companies values can be stated one way, but the only way the values show up in decisions and actions. Yeah, no, I, I, I love that you raise that because I think sometimes people nowadays, you know, feel under pressure to have kind of very esoteric uh, values and you know, very highbrow and all of that and something as, as you know, as, as, as uh, gauche as money is something that they try to push down. But at the end of the day, if that's what you're in it for, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Um, you know, as long as you conduct yourself in the right fashion, just as if you're into some other value that's important to you. As well, long and as let's you remember yourself. that, yeah, that money, wealth, uh, is it, what it, it's not for its own sake. It's a translation into something. You know, everything gets us something. It's how we're taking care of our family, how we're measuring our success, how we're, if I'm making more sales, am I helping my clients more? Like, is that a demonstration of I have an impact because if more people are using my software or my tool or what, you know, my, my uh, company's services, that's a measure. So again, you know, I, I caution people from judging or trying to re retrofit their values as to something they think is going to be socially acceptable. Uh, it's they just need to be yours and you need they need to be a point where you calibrate your actions and where you spend your time against them yeah no that, that's why i always love when people bring out these surveys and say oh look you know m money is like number eight on the list of things that are important to go yeah because nobody wants to put it number one because they feel pressure not to so uh, you know you can dismiss that <laughs> one good, to be honest yeah it's it's it's, it's <laughs> a good it's a good insight i i think all surveys yeah. today need to be looked at with a little bit of skepticism because people are people are smart and you know people the way that they want to be represented i mean this is again back to brain science uh we want to think higher of ourselves it's very rare that if we, i think something's going to be published somewhere that i'm going to be super honest with it so i i don't think all of our media has caught on to the fact that surveys are are not always valid to make macro decisions from but that's a, that's a, yeah, that's a yeah. conversation for another day <laughs> yeah yeah no absolutely uh, given the track record yes exactly um right. and then the second part of the book is revise what you say and you know i really like this because i really think that because of the kind of world we live in and it's a very casual and tick tocky and all this kind of <laughs> stuff and you know people don't i mean i can't even i have to often look up on google what the text message i got from my son actually means because there's no words in it um and I think we've lost sight of the power of words and the power of language and the power of what you what you say and how you choose to say it. Mm -hmm. I think actually we've we worked ourselves into this trap of believing that a short and sweet, you know, bottom line on top um, that, uh, you know, oh, I it just, you know, I don't need to say thank you to an email, just, you know, make it really quick. But the truth is, then we lose meaning. And there's actually some really interesting research about digital communication that's only come out in the past couple of years uh, in looking at how people are using all of our digital communication tools, not just text and email, which is a dinosaur at this point, you know, but Slack and um, various instant message, uh, direct messages, all these different types of tools that we use on a regular basis. And finding that miscommunication, that the misfiring takes actually three or four times more time than if two people actually had a conversation or a longer email might be more efficient than the five texts back and forth uh, because we can't see into each other's brains. So you know, this is a great tip for sales leaders, for professionals in general, of just recognizing that you might have to go a beat further. You're the expert in your product, in your service, um, but other people, they, you, they can't see inside your, in, in your jar, right? They can't read the label from the, from the inside. You are the person who, when you're talking about it, you're often starting kind of in the middle of the story. You always, but you need to go back for everybody to once upon a time, to go to the beginning of the alphabet instead of starting in the middle of the alphabet. It, uh, it's a big habit that we really do need to uh, know that it's okay to explain a little further. 
Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree. And, and I just think this casualness that we've become very, you know, we've become trapped in this casualness. And as I said, where, as you said, like, oh, I don't need to say thank you to that. I don't need to explain anything. I don't need to do anything. I, I don't even, as I said, I don't even need to read and write in words anymore. Um, but I think you always have to look at, OK, who's on the receiving end of this and how would I like if I was getting this in return how would I like it and yeah we can all con ourselves and go oh yeah it'd be fine by me but the reality is you don't know so wouldn't you err on the side of caution one of the chapters is called ask for what you need and one of pieces of research that I found in developing that is called the illusion of transparency and the illusion of transparency tells us that we believe other people know what we need without us having to say it. And so if you've ever been in your household and someone's walked past an overflowing trash can and you're like, how come you didn't think to and to take that out to the garage? Um, you know what that is, right? You why do we have to ask people to empty the trash? But the fact is we have to ask people what we, you know, what we need, whether that's uh, even to go so far as to say, are you ready to sign the contract to make the sale? Are we, um, so what else do you need in order to say yes to this this promotion? Uh, you know, we we need to get to those level of specifics. We can't assume that people know we have to help them get to the right place. And we have to be be brave enough to be clear about asking for what we need. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point, uh, you know, particularly in sales sometimes is that I, I think uh, suffering from happy ears, what I call it, is <laughs> Is where you point. where you say where you say something and then I interpret it right. I interpret it for myself and then probably for my sales manager later. And I'm like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Darcy's already to sign the contract and say, oh, she said that, and you go, yeah, yeah. But the reality is, you didn't say that. I just I just decided that based on the conversation we were having, it sounded like you were ready. <laughs> and I think that's the big difference. Yeah, yes, we and we we just we can't read each other as well as we think we can. And so that's again where words and getting clear on the words and helping others be accountable to answers. So not getting an answer about uh, about signing the contract. If you haven't asked a direct question, you're not going to get the answer. And if the answer is well, I'm not sure, that's an answer, right? That you know, that that helps yeah. you have a strategy. Yeah, no, it, it's it's so true because oftentimes when things go south, if you track it back, it'll be it'll track back to the fact that you know, some questions were never asked explicitly. Mm -hmm. um, you thought maybe you were asking them, but they weren't explicit enough. And by the way, I I know you were referring to my son who uh, who's <laughs> well able to walk walk past a full trash can on a daily basis and never even notice it. Yeah, you are not alone. There are people in many of our households and your listeners' households, I think, who probably uh, who probably track the same way. Yeah. Exactly. And so the, the third part of your book is reinventing what you do. And I love this. This is a very uh, intriguing chapter title is Forge a Fear Strategy. The truth is that in our careers, there are always going to be times when we hit fear. It is just a natural part of being human. Yet we're so afraid of the time of becoming afraid. And then when fear hits, then we freeze, right? We don't know what to do and we flail. And I meet people who they've just been in this swirl, this constant circle of if I do that, this is going to happen. If that, that, and they're they're stuck. So by now stopping and saying, okay, what's my fear strategy? When fear is going to hit, not if, but when, what is the thing that I do to, you know, break my brain strategy to disrupt the flow. And it could be as simple as saying, anytime I feel that fear, or I feel that sinking in my stomach, I just go and drink a glass of water or I get up and I walk around the room. Um, it doesn't have to be big and dramatic. It just has to disrupt your brain long enough that you don't a act out in fear, you know, yell at somebody, type an email that you wish you could call back, um, that you just like, I feel the fear. What's my thing I always do? I always go to, you know, drink a glass of water. And just that gives us uh, an agreement with ourselves that when that fear hits, that we, we're not going to be lost. We'll get back in control and we can get back in control pretty quickly. 
Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree. I mean, I think if more people drank that glass of water before firing off those emails or whatever, the world would be a better place or maybe. And, uh, and I say that out of experience. So that is one of my <laughs> things that it's like, oh, I got, that's what I got to do because I have, I have sometimes not. So, you know, we learn, <laughs> yeah, we live yeah, and learn. Yeah. Maybe I should keep a bottle of whiskey handy. But, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but one of the things on fear, I, I, I've talked about this a, a, a number of times with guests because I think it's a really critical thing is, you know, we often think about um, fear of failure, right? We hear that all the time, fear of failure. But I think especially for a lot of professionals, it's, fear of success is a much bigger thing. And it's something that we don't always recognize. Uh, the fact is, you know, maybe there's an opportunity to move up in the company, but then we want it desperately. But then we start thinking about, well, if I move up, maybe I have to move home. Uh, you know, maybe I have to relocate. Maybe I have to do this and it changes things, maybe separate from these things. And we talk ourselves out of opportunities, not because we're afraid we'll fail at it, because we're afraid what success, change success might bring. Well, and I think that in that case, that situation, and we see this a lot too, where people are actively looking at a new job, or maybe they're they're uh, they're re they're bored, they're ready for promotion, they're ready for opportunity, but we try to make decisions too far down the line instead of what's you know, what's the rock that's right in front of me I can put my foot on now. Like, what's the closest rock? So. Maybe I don't know if I want that promotion or not because it's going to cause more travel or it's going to throw off my work-life balance. But if I don't put the rock on the neck, you know, my foot on the next rock to say, let me have a conversation about it. Let me, you know, let me just start talking to people about what that looks like. You know, if I don't do that, I never get there. You, know, you always have the power of changing your mind. You always have the power of no. I've seen many people get caught in corporate situations where the internal job promotion, you know, if there's a posted role, someone saying, well, if I post for it, then that's sort of implying that I, that I have to take it. The truth is, it's not because you don't even know fully what that is yet. You, that's why we have interviews. That's why we have conversations. And often there are ways that we, we think there has to be a strict process, but there are often ways to have really good conversations with other people, even maybe even the hiring manager, before you start an official process, because why waste people's time? But don't talk yourself out of things. Just take the next step and know that every step you get to make another decision. Yeah, no, that's uh, I agree completely. That's fantastic. And the last thing I just wanted to uh, draw attention to is magnify momentum, because um, I'm, I'm a big believer in momentum. I think most people are. And sometimes uh, sometimes it's the tiniest bit of momentum. You know, all momentum starts with small moves anyway, but it's it's often those little little moves that we overlook rather than embracing and, sh and showing ourselves. Yeah, things are starting to work. Yeah. And, 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 you know, in that chapter, we talk a lot and in, in Pursue Progress, too, we talk about the ta-da moments. You know, I tell the story about b visiting China with my dad and um, we went to uh, acrobats in Shanghai. And it just struck me that no matter what, no matter if they hit the trick or if they dropped the plates or dropped somebody who they were spiraling in the air, they would always end with that, you know, gymnastics, hands up, ta-da. But our workplaces today are so complicated, we don't always find those ta-da's. And so how do we find more of them? Uh, just having the call completed, ta-da, uh, as, as opposed to waiting till the sale is complete. Um, you know, being able to have a tough conversation, like ta-da, give yourself credit for that. So finding those little wins to keep us in momentum and keep us feeling like we're making progress, which is so important. Yeah, no, I think that is so important because we definitely lose sight of those things. And some, yeah, we're very good at beating ourselves up. And yeah, I mean, maybe sometimes it's it's justified, but I think also other times you have to look at it and say, yes, okay, have to your point earlier about, you know, we tend to look at the big prize and that's all we're focused on. It's like, oh, there's a job, you know, there's a promotion coming up. And then I'm totally focused on what happens when I get it, as opposed to looking at the process and saying, OK, let's take it one step at a time. And then, as you said, celebrate these steps. Same with whatever you're doing at work is celebrate every f time you put a one foot in front of the other as opposed to backwards. 
Right. Every decision counts. Even a decision to say, you know, I've gone four steps down this road and now I have the data that I feel confident that this isn't the right fit for me. Terrific. Ta-da. You know, that's a win, right? It's a win to choose not to do something in the same way that it's a win to do something. So, but we've yeah. got to find those for ourselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's a fantastic piece of information that's going to impact the rest of your life is if every time you go down a path and realize it's not the right path for you. Well, there you go. You just saved yourself a lot of grief and it maybe has eliminated some paths. So it's helped you focus on the ones that really matter. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Decisions. Yeah. Uh, we make decisions all the time. And the root of the word decision is to cut. And often when we're gets when we're stuck, we're not making enough decisions and decisions are what make us leaders, you know, leaders are people who make decisions. So when we can't wait for the perfect decision, uh, we just have to keep making decisions and learning from what happens from them. And there's, I think there's no bad decision. You just have to make the right one for you at the time and you learn from it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Listen, Darcy, this has been fantastic. And all of Coach Darcy's information is going to be below this video, including you know, links to the book, Red Cape Rescue, Save Your Career Without Leaving Your Job. But before we go, uh, Darcy, please tell people a little bit more about what you do. Sure. I work with leaders and teams uh, to really help them be able to take back control and manage all the complex change that's going on in our world with a little bit of humor and courage uh, roped in. I speak, I facilitate, and I do private coaching one-on-one -on -one with professionals who uh, want that little extra boost and a little extra support and a safe space to be able to create some new ideas for what's next for them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I'd encourage you to go check out uh, Coach Darcy's website. Check out the book Red Cape Rescue, Save Your Career Without Leaving Your Job. Um, listen, thanks again for today. Thank you for watching and listening, and I'll see you all again very soon. Thank you. Thanks for having me.